Well, take your Bibles, please, and join me in Acts chapter 4. We're going to be looking this morning at verses 24 through 31. You know, one of my concerns always as the president of Brooks is that the studies that you have would strengthen your relationship with Christ and not stifle it. I've told you this before, but I remember when I first went away to seminary, I was shocked at how many cars were still in the dorm parking lots on Sunday morning. Guys just, they they were so overwhelmed with their studies. They weren't even taking the time to go corporately worship God with other believers. And, And I don't want that to happen to you. And often it really damages our prayer life to to be in academia. Uh, We're so focused on on the word, we're so focused on theology that we really forget the importance of praying and, and the incredible price that was paid so that we would have access to the Father. I mean, the price was the blood of Jesus. And so this morning, I want to encourage you Uh, to be praying, and to be praying effectively, and to be praying in a way that is going to uh, touch the heart of God, and in a way that is going to be just powerful. And so, one of my favorite prayers in all of the Bible, matter of fact, it's a great study just to look at all the prayers in the Bible. Uh, If any of you have some extra money and you're looking for a book, a guy named James Roscup wrote a three-volume series on all the prayers in the Bible, and he does a commentary on all the prayers in the Bible. But I think of all of them, my favorite is this one that appears in Acts chapter 4, verses 24 through 31. Let me read it to you. It says, And when they had heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, O Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal. And signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And I would challenge you that this is a tremendous model prayer for us. Uh, This prayer really gives us a pattern for effective praying. Now, to really understand the prayer, we need to understand the occasion. And one of the reasons why that this prayer presents such a good model for us is because of the occasion on which it was prayed. Well, look up at verses 1 through 22. This is about Peter and John. And it says, As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. And when they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, 
By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated, untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, but so that it will not spread any further among the people. Let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. And when they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them. On account of the people, because they were glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And when they had been released they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said to them. So the Jewish authorities arrested Peter and John. They have threatened them, threatened their lives, that they have to stop preaching the gospel. The, the Sanhedrin, uh, they have the power to have these men beaten anytime they want. And this same group of men were very successful at getting Pilate to crucify Jesus, even though he could find no just charge against him. This is frightening. This is a threat against the gospel. It's not just a threat against two men. It's a threat against the gospel. And, and right here is the first time in the book of Acts where we begin to see how costly it's going to be to be a disciple of Jesus. Carrying on the work of Christ on earth is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. It's going to face great opposition. And so I think this is an appropriate model prayer for us because of the occasion on which it was prayed. Now you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're not being persecuted. No one's threatening us because we're talking about Jesus. But I would say that this was an occasion of desperation that was born from a crisis. It was a time when the early church really needed Christ to move. How often do you need God's power? How often do you really need him to move in your life for good? How often do you really come to the realization that Without him, you are nothing. And you know, beloved, we're, we're always in that circumstance, whether we realize it or not. I mean, we tend to go through life every day just kind of saying, oh, yeah, I've got this. And then when a crisis comes, we, we feel all of a sudden now we're wanting to turn to the Lord. But the reality is we depend on him for everything. He is our total sufficiency. You know, you, you may have... You know, a pretty fair idea that there's going to be food at home tonight when you go home. And maybe you bought it or your parents bought it, but you know what? Ultimately, it comes from God. He's the one who gives our daily bread. You know, we need to ask God constantly through Christ to be meeting our needs, to be filling us with spiritual power. We need to be asking him for wisdom. We need to be asking him for the strength to live holy lives and to resist temptation, the power to bear fruit for the kingdom of God, the fruit not only internally but externally. It's an appropriate model prayer because the circumstance, the context reminds us that we need to live in a way where we are continually desperate for God. 
You know, I read the Psalms of David. You know, I read one this morning when he is fleeing from King Saul and how desperate he is to just know that God is near, to know that God is working in his circumstances and in his life. And, you know, praying this way helps us not to take God for granted. Praying with a sense of desperation reminds us that whatever we have now, it could all be taken away in a moment. I mean, life can change very quickly. And, you know, you have a whole semester ahead of you of hard work, deep study, trying to comprehend new material, new ideas. Writing papers, that was always the bane of my existence. You know, I loved lectures. I loved, uh, you know, learning and reading. I, I hate to write. I just, to this day, I hate to write. It's an agony for me. So I'll never be a PhD like Dr. Wilson because I just can't write several hundred pages on anything. I just, I can't make myself do it. But you know what? You need God this semester. You need Christ to be working powerfully through you. So, well, I'm a great student. I've got this covered. You know, you need to live in desperation for Christ, and, and, and that ought to motivate you to prayer. I'd say this prayer is also a great example for us because of who did the praying. It says in verse 23, and in the first part of verse 24, that when Peter and John had been released, they went to their own companions. Now, this means they went to the rank and file, ordinary members of the church. Now, I don't know what the circumstances were, but I would think Peter and John could have rounded up some of the other apostles. You know, they could have found some of the other guys. And, you know, if I had the opportunity to ask an apostle to pray for me, you know, I would certainly do that. But, but the reality is, Every believer has the same access to God through Christ. You know, pastors, one of the most frustrating things for me as a pastor is when people think that if I don't pray for them, you know, nothing good is going to happen. You know, if, if one of my elders goes to the hospital before the surgery, well, why didn't the pastor come pray for me? It's like somehow my prayers have some kind of superpower and they don't. And what I love about this prayer is that Peter and John, these two eminent apostles who have spent three and a half years with the Lord Jesus, learning things that we probably will never know until we get to heaven. When they need prayer, they just go to the ordinary members of the church. Now, now bear in mind that the church is only at this point two chapters old. I mean, the church is brand new. How, how mature do you think the majority of these Christians are in this congregation? How, how much have they learned? How much have they really grown? I mean, it's, the church is very new. And yet, instead of going to the other apostles, they went to a group of baby Christians and said, pray for us. You know, very often you may think that your prayers really aren't effective, that, that your prayers aren't really going beyond the ceiling. But if you are a born-again believer and you are praying in faith, you have access to God. And the prayers of the saints are, are precious to God. He wants you to pray. You say, well, you know, there, there are people that have, you know, more, more influence, you know, before the throne of God than me. Beloved, no, what God loves is someone with a broken and contrite heart who's desperate for God to move. And, and I love this because this, this example here shows us that, that everybody can pray and that everyone has the responsibility, everyone who's born again. You know, I think of um, an example of Paul. When Paul wrote his prison epistles, there's one epistle where he makes a very heartfelt and personal request for prayer. At the end of Colossians, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well. 
that God will open up to us a door for the words so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way that I ought to speak. Now, Paul didn't ask the Ephesians to do this for him. That was the mature church. That was the solid church. He didn't ask the Philippians to do this for him. That was still a pretty good church. He asked the Colossians to pray for him so that he would know what to say when he preaches the gospel. The Colossian church is theologically kind of a mess. Uh, These are Christians that Paul has never met. And, And it's a tiny little church. It's not an influential church. But to them, he says, pray for me that I would know how I ought to speak. I mean, if I would think that anyone would instinctively know how to preach the gospel, it would be the Apostle Paul. I mean, this is the greatest theologian of the New Testament. And here he is saying, you know, I really need help. I really need to know what to preach and how to, how to present Christ to men. And he asked these very immature believers who are still grappling with who Christ is and what Christ has done so everyone can pray. This prayer is also a great model for us because of the priority in the praying. These people at Jerusalem may have been relatively new believers, but I've got to tell you, they pray in a very mature way. And look at the priority of their praying. Verses 24 through 28, And when they had heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. So this entire prayer is seven verses. But these believers took five verses, 126 words, to praise God, to hallow the name of God. Remember, Jesus said, when you pray, pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And these believers start with that kind of idea in mind, that they're hallowing God. They they talk about the fact that he's their creator, Now, there's an urgent need. You have Peter and John standing here. They've been threatened. They've been humiliated. I mean, they've been tried unfairly. You would think I would be praying, God, protect these men. Hide these men. Or God, change the hearts of the Sadducees so that there would be favor for these men. And immediately, they just go into praise to God. First of all, you know, he's their creator. And by the way, you know, that's a great thing to, to remind ourselves of when we pray. By the way, God doesn't need to be reminded that he's the creator, but you do. Because whatever it is you need that you think you don't have, he created it. <laughs> or he created the capacity for it. And he owns it. He owns everything. And then they talk about his sovereignty. You know, uh, he quotes Psalm 2. You know, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand. And, And he quotes that. And then he talks about how Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Sadducees, the leaders of the Jews, they were all opposed to Jesus. I mean, you don't have a chance in first century Jerusalem up against these three groups. And yet, look at what they did. They say they did whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Let me ask you, were the Sadducees trying to advance the ministry of Jesus? 
No. Was Pilate? No. W was Herod? No. Th they all wanted to do what? They wanted to kill him. They wanted to eliminate him. And yet they ended up doing, out of evil intent, exactly the very thing that God had predestined to happen. That they actually did the will of God, even though that was not their intent. They furthered the ministry of Jesus. They offered him as a sacrifice for sin, something that needed to happen. So they remind God and they remind themselves that he's sovereign. Listen, whatever's going on in your life, whatever obstacles you're facing, whatever battles you're fighting, you know, God knows. Nothing surprises him. He's in control. And he's using all of these things ultimately to accomplish his good purpose for you. So they remind themselves of his sovereignty. And then, then they actually make their request. 126 words to praise God, only 41 to make their request. Look at what they say. In verse 29, And now, O Lord, take note of their threats, and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence, while you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So they have three requests, and they're not the three requests that would have come to my mind. I'll just confess, I would have prayed for the safety of Peter and John. Prayed for wisdom to know how to maybe present the gospel in a way that the Sadducees were okay with. Uh, you know, prayed to an end of the persecution, prayed for an end to the persecution. They asked for three things. First of all, they ask that the Lord would just take note of the threats. Lord, see these threats? Good. <laughs> You know, this is not just a threat against these two men. This is a threat against the entire church. This is a threat against the gospel spreading. And they say, Lord, we, we know it's your will that the gospel be proclaimed. But we know that it's your will that it go out to the whole earth. So just, Lord, by the way, take note that they're threatening us. You know, they really don't ask God to do anything more than that, but they know, I think, by faith, that God knows about the threats and he's going to do whatever needs to be done. The second thing they ask for is boldness. Now, this is interesting to me because boldness is exactly what got Peter and John into this mess. They were boldly preaching the gospel and that's why the Sadducees got so upset. And instead of praying for something to kind of calm the situation down or to mitigate it, they're saying, God, turn up the heat. Give all of us the power to speak with boldness. i got to tell you, that, that's an incredible prayer request to make. And then the third thing they asked for was keep doing miracles. Keep doing miracles. Now, now we don't live in an age where miracles are happening, uh, at least not performed by apostles. Miracles still can happen. God can do anything he wants, but nobody has the gift of miracles anymore. But they're saying, God, keep these miracles going because you know what? These miracles, the Sadducees had nothing to say. I mean, they couldn't ignore the fact that in the name of Jesus, a man was healed. And so keep doing this because this confirms that the message of the gospel is true, that the message of the gospel is something that all men need to believe. These miracles confirm that we are your servants. Listen, instead of praying for comfort all the time and relief all the time, we need to be praying that God would use our circumstances to accomplish his good work in us. That's exactly what they're praying for. And finally, I would say this prayer is a tremendous model for us because of the answer that came. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak the word with boldness. I would say here you have an answer immediately to all three requests. Because they prayed for the right things. (laughs) Is God noticing the situation? Yes. How do we know? He shook the building. I mean, he literally shook the building. It was like an earthquake going on. God's noticing. And then it says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. What did they ask for? Boldness. Now all of them are speaking with boldness, and and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. This isn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the one-time thing. This is the filling of the Holy Spirit that we need continually. But we're to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, we're to be dying to self and yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit's control. And by the way, with the filling of the Holy Spirit, I think there's an assurance that miracles are going to go on for as long as they are needed to confirm the message of the Word, the message of the apostles, the message of Christ, the gospel. And so I would just challenge you right here at the beginning of the semester to commit yourself to praying, to commit yourself to drawing near to God. There are going to be all kinds of things in the coming weeks that pull you away from your devotional life. Do not let that happen. Fight it. You know, it's better to get a a B and to be walking with God than to get an A and a heart that's absolutely cold and dead to the things of God because you neglected your time with him. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do your best, but I'm saying you have to have right priorities. And the reason we are training you is not just to fill up your heads. It's so that you will be filled with the Holy Spirit of God to use what you've learned to minister effectively to the church. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these students. I thank you for the faculty and the staff here. And I just pray that the coming days would be glorious, that you would work in our hearts, that you would strengthen us, that you would mature us, and that you would be glorified in our lives. I pray for these students that you would just help them to remain faithful to drawing near to you continually and, and praying even when time just seems to be so short. And God, I just pray that you'd give them the grace and the strength uh, to do what you've called them here to do. And, And God, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.